Welcome back to another episode of Books Closed. This episode is sponsored by Lucky Supply and River Valley Printing Co. Today we are broadcasting to you from San Jose at the State of Grace, and I'm joined here by my new friend Taki. Hello. <laughs> thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for inviting me here. This is awesome. I've never been to this shop or this city ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless you're a Sharks fan or in the tech industry, yeah, like most people go to San Francisco or Oakland. So thanks for making the trip down. And I'm really hoping that I'm not going to be the the uh, the, the uh, victim of one of your spoof things, but or maybe I am. I don't know. We'll see. But I actually, anyhow. I did this whole podcast up until now, so I can perfectly orchestrate this spoof on uh, you. Like right, right. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm on candid camera. Like they're just gonna be like, ha ha ha, we got you, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah. wouldn't that be weird if that was true though? What right? What would be my motivation? It, I, it, dude, it, but it, it'd just be like like you know like levels of deviousness. <laughs> You know what I mean? Because cause I got to say, you are like the guy right now. Like, you're the funny guy of tattooing. So I was a little bit, like, I'm honored, but yet a little scared. And then I feel like we're talking about social media. So if we're not doing this on Instagram Live, then what's the point even? Like, did it really even happen if it's not That's on Instagram? That's a good Instagram? point. You know so I mean? thanks so. for joining us. Uh, we'll be back next week. We'll be on Instagram Live. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> like, right, complete F. But anyhow, yeah, so here we are. Uh, I'd say first, let's talk about your convention that you do. Sure. Um, we're in our 14th year. Uh, we kind of had a novel concept. Um, and when I say we, I'm talking my, my partner, Roman and I, um, you know, he's a motorcycle builder. He's tatted up, you know, just like small business owner like myself. We've been friends for fuck, two decades at least. Um, but you know, he was basically pushing me like, Hey, the Bay area needs to have a good convention. And what, what I mean by that is like, a convention that is actually focused on tattooing. And I, and I, I know that sounds terribly sarcastic. Um, but really like I go to a lot of shows and they're fun, but it just feels like we're not really, it's not about tattooing. It's about the bands or, you know, the cars or the vendors or the sponsors. And that's cool. You know, like that's fine. Like there's a place for all of that. But, um, through the course of my career, I've been really lucky. Like I've, I've met a lot of the old timers who we consider old timers and they all talk about like, you know, the Queen Mary, the Rome zebra show where it was just such a cool gathering where tattooers could network and meet each other. And that's what we wanted to create. And so like, you know, I kind of our first, you know, obviously there are a lot of hiccups along the way. Like we didn't have a promotion team. We didn't have an event coordinator. We had to learn it as we went and we certainly made a lot of mistakes. We probably wasted a lot of money. We haven't really made any money, but at the same time, like we've managed to build a reputation that, Hey, these guys throw a show that's pro tattooing. Like we're 100% tattooing. We don't have piercing. We have, you know, very few vendors and the ones we have are, are really like members of the tattoo community. Um, we, we, we do invites. I mean, that's the funny thing is like, we'll get these like, I mean, I love these like DMs and emails that are like, booth, how much? Or, hey, I went to your website. Yo, There's... give me them booths. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? And it's just like, oh, I didn't see an application form. Well, yeah, because there isn't one. <laughs> but we're not trying to be snobs, okay? I mean, that's the thing. Like, what we feel, though, is that we do want to keep a certain quality standard. Because um, let's face it, right now there's a million tattooers out there. And also to... Um, I and think a so. million conventions. Right, yeah, there are. And, you know, and what, what, what can set us apart? And I think that's one thing we look at is... Um, you know, because I feel like most tat- – like there's a lot of really great tattooing happening right now. So it's really hard to pick like what – who stands out. And for me, there's like – there's a certain originality factor. There's people that are doing something new and fresh. There's people like th- – like there's this Andrew Stortz guy. He's fucking hilarious, right? <laughs> like um, I mean – Too bad it's not a kind, comedy he's convention. kind of an asshole probably. <laughs> like, he's a little mean-spirited, but he's funny as shit, right? But let's, no, but like really like we, we try to find people – that are really sort of like on the, like, you know, like really ear to the street, breaking new ground kind of thing. We try to work with companies that are like that. And like, you know, we work with companies that are tattoo or owned as well. That's important to us that it's not like Roman and I aren't front men for a company. You know, it's, it, this is us. This is our fucking bank accounts on the line. When we do this, this is, you know, we're putting our name on it. We're not fronting anyone else, you know? So I think that's, um, and we've been lucky, like we've had the support of the tattoo community. People have been very nice to us. Um, well, it's a no-brainer as a tattooer to support a show like that over sure. some of the other ones that you you kind of feel like you get screwed sometimes. I mean, I've been to shows and people are like, oh, yeah, I'm just waiting for this band to come on. I'm like, well, why the fuck am I here? You know what I mean? Like, And it's just kind of like, and sure, our door numbers are way lower, you know, but that's okay because what, what I love about our show um, is things like, 
meeting some 20 year old who's like, dude, I saved up two grand. I just got a Steve burn, a Koji, a Tony. You know what I mean? Like they'll get four tats in like three days yeah. or like sitting in the lobby and like, like with like Luciano and Adam Vu and Koji and like, you know, like, like people from like six different countries. And to me, that's what a convention is about. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So do you feel that it attracts a, a higher quality attendee? Yes. Compared to other conventions? Oh, definitely. I, I think um, we have collectors come. I've actually had certain vendors tell us that they'll sell more at a show that has clearly lesser people through the door because I think a lot of the people are either tattooers or collectors. Yeah, you they're know, not there think, just to like walk around and check it out. Right, right, right. I yeah. mean, and there's some of that and sure. we welcome that, but yeah. we also don't, we don't have contests. You know, we don't have, you know, beauty pageants. We don't have, and if we ever do, I want to do like, like a trans one or something. That'd be, it'd be awesome. But you know, like, I'm just saying like, we're just, we've just rejected that whole notion of the traditional, um, entertainment, I suppose is what the word would be, where we just want it to be about tattooing, no piercing, no suspensions. None of, and, and not, I'm not saying it's, that stuff's bad, you know? But I think, I think some shows will use that as a crutch or like, that's right. the main draw. So mm -hmm. people aren't getting tattooed at all. Right, right, right. And it, sure, it sure, just sure. kind of kills it. But then yeah. on, on the other hand, it's cool to think if, if some normal, you know, some person who's not into tattoos sees it in the newspaper, mm -hmm. your convention, and they sure. say, I'm going to check out this convention for the first time. Imagine that is your first exposure to tattooing. Right, right. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty and, and rare experience, I would say, these days compared sure, to uh, sure. the other kinds of shows you can roll into. Yeah. And it's hard, though. And, and I do like, um, I think like um, with my tattoo career, with any book I've done, with anything I do, I, I try to think it's not so much about the other people. Like, I feel like your worst, like, critic, your worst competition is yourself you know like we're trying to be better than our last show but i will say this like the large number of tattooing tattoo conventions it's kind of a bummer because you get people that had a bad experience or there's there's been one show where it's kind of like like we kind of joke about like that's the show that everyone has to get the tattoos fixed up after you know what <laughs> i mean like there's no quality standard like we're talking people yeah. that don't even work at shops can get in so i really wish overall that most shows would just kind of like let's just make it all better um you know, I think like right now, like, like I get asked a lot, like what's different now? I've been tattooing 20 years, which is not a long time, it's more than some, less than others. Right. And you figure like, okay, I'm going to order an awesome machine, great needles, great supplies right off the bat. A tattooer who 20 years ago would have never told me what needle groupings they use is now going to tell me exactly what they use, what inks they use, all of that. But what's really the difference is the access to reference to, um, styles like, okay, for example, I remember Ed Hardy telling me like in the 70s and 80s, like if a Japanese tattooer sent you a Polaroid of a tattoo, you treasured that. Like that was gold. I remember even when I wrote Bushido and that was in like 90, oh God, I'm old, 98 or 99. Jesus, you're old. I am, right? Like I wrote this, it was a book. But you know, <laughs> but like when we, when we printed that, I think Schiffer printed it in 2000, like the Japanese distributor wouldn't even carry it because they said it was a Yakuza book. You know what I mean? And mm. I remember showing it to people and people were like, whoa, this is like, you know, and it's like, cause we, I think the only books we really had were like those big, um, K Buncha ones, like, and, and they were too expensive to like let customers see. Right. Like we was like 30 bucks. You'd be like, here, check this out. Yeah. And I really like, I feel like I used that to like, you know, aside from like, it was a learning experience myself writing a book and I felt proud that able to share something that I had observed and learned, share something from my country, culture and country, but also just, it was a way for me to promote, this is the type of work I want to do. And I don't think anyone cares about that anymore because it's all on there. Like, and maybe that's cool. Maybe it's a level playing field, but I feel like, um, our accessibility to everything maybe makes us appreciate it a little less. Does that make sense? It does. And sometimes I wonder, is it just that it's not there? You know, it, those books aren't coming out anymore. So is that – maybe people do care, but it's just not there for them. I mean, or maybe things are changing. Like, for okay, for example, I used to love LPs. And um, remember when Crass would have big poster foldouts? And then it turned to CDs. And then it turned to, like, just downloads. Nobody does album art anymore. There's a whole mm -hmm. genre of art, you know, from movie – like, album art – I'm sorry, movie – I'm getting uh, my things crossed up here. But, <laughs> but there's a whole genre of album art that's gone now. Yeah. You know what I mean? That that's like, and, and the funny thing is, I I still own some LPs, but like they're actually at my mom's house in some closet, and I don't even have a record player anymore. And then, ironically, I love books. I've published tons of books. I've written books. I'm still working on books. I have a, like like you know we have a three bedroom. One bedroom is our study with all the books. 
and yet I still find myself when I'm drawing, I'll Google something because I don't. Yeah, I'm me too. too. Yeah, I'm too lazy to go upstairs and look for it. You know, and it used to be like that reference was gold. Mm-hmm. Like I'll tell you a funny story. Like I was told one time when I first saw that book, Tibetan Tonka painting. Remember that one? And I was told by the guy that showed it to me, like, don't show this to people, okay? And it was kind of like this thing, like, you know, that the West Coast had, like, oh, yeah, we're, you know, we were on this new cutting edge stuff, right? Ironically, Ed Hardy published all those books in his bibliography of Tattoo Time, like, in the 80s. <laughs> so, I mean, if you had, like, the wherewithal to actually look for it, it was all there. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, but, like, I feel like there's a certain generation that just doesn't care about books anymore the same way. But then the certain things are coming back. Like, you know, like you, sh- you sh- saw me doing Tabori earlier. And I, I kind of liken that to like, okay, as, as we're moving forward to like, you know, we have like these, like, you know, the, um, the, mach- the, the machines that are now like the wand looking things. And like, we're going further from coil machine, you know what I mean? Like, um, like the whole type of tattooing is changing, like the cartridge systems, like the, I guess the mechanical things we're using are changing. What do you think about stuff like that? Um, you know, okay. So a few things, uh, like I, I'm kind of like a torn like as a Japanese American and I, you know, I work with Horitomo and Hori Fuji who are both from Japan. Raised, like I, I was born in Japan, but I was raised here. So I'm kind of a weird in between guy. But um, like, so I feel like, like Horitomo and Hori Fuji both outlined by machine, they shade by hand. And that's what I'm trying to do. And I'll tell you right now, it's damn hard. It's like my analogy to everyone is like, imagine if you had a motorcycle and I took it away and I gave you a bicycle. That's how I feel. Like, I feel like I'm learning to walk again. But then I also feel a certain sense of pride. And a lot of that, it's not just from these Japanese. It's also watching people like, you know, Peter Sulape, um, these Samoans that are like doing you know, hundreds of years of this, of tapping and just taking pride in that culture. So I think what, while there are people looking to the future, there's always going to be people looking back. There's going to be and, – and for everybody who's like, you know what, I'm just going to buy a needle. There's going to be somebody who's like, I want to seek out the person who makes his own needles or who does it by hand. So I do, I do think there's a value with that. Now, when it comes to machine building, I think because the Japanese have this hand style, like I, I don't think Japanese differentiate between rotary or coil or wand. It's all electrical. So you're, you've already sold out. So it's kind of like, you know, it's like, oh, whatever. Whichever way you're doing it, it's not Tabori. You know what I mean? Um, as far as I'm concerned, like, you know, I used to kind of be like a coil guy. And now it's like I've found, like, to be honest, like, like you know, rotaries, like I, I can pack color in a lot better with less skin trauma. Um, I actually had this discussion because, um, you know, like I use bishops and I really like them a lot. Um, I also like, I think, um, I will say this, I don't think ro- any rotary that I've seen, with the exception of Dan Kubin, has the charm and the, uh, how can I say it, the, um, the, the character of a coil machine. Like, like I have this, like, you know, like, like, oh, let's see. like look, this Tim Hendricks machine is beautiful. Like, I love this thing. You know, I remember mm-hmm. when, like, I looked at it, I was like, Tim puts love into it, you know what I mean? And then, like, but, you know. It's kind of like an old classic car, you know? And then I, I feel like the, like Dan Kubin is kind of like the most innovative guy. Like his shit's like on a whole nother level. Like he's like, you can tune it like this. And I'm just like, ah, oh, you're confusing me. I'm too stupid for this. And every time you get a machine, he's already got the next version of it already. Yeah, out. right? It's, yeah. Like, it's like an iPhone. You can never stay current yeah, with Yeah, and, and he's got like, oh, there's three settings here. I'm like, now you're confusing me. I just need one. Like I can't <laughs> deal with how... It's too hard. Yeah, like I don't even... Like he's one of those people that his brain just is on a different level, you know. But another funny story about him, um, he show, well, like the first time he did our convention, like on the Friday he shows up. He's like, hey, did you want to get a machine? I was like, yeah, I'll buy this one. He has like two cases of machines, beautiful cases, handmade by Mike Foley. So, of course, not only does he have these amazing machines, he has this guy build a fucking awesome case to carry it in, right? And then he sold out before the convention even opened. And he's like, I'm going to go to the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> like, I'm like, so you're like, that's awesome, but I need to put a tattooer in your booth now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like it was freaking hilarious, but I'm happy for him. Yeah, it's but, great. So I had this conversation with Tomo once, and I, you know, Hori Tomo. And I, you know, and I look up to Hori Tomo a lot. Um, as Japanese, it's ironic because we actually have the same last name, Kitamura. But we're also, you know, we're sworn brothers. And so I look to him for all my, like, artistic guidance and whatnot. And I asked him one time, like, yeah, well, should we be, like, you know, like, should we be outlining by hand? Like, because there are some families that still do that, and that's the old school way, right? And his whole thing was like, well, I can, you know, I can't achieve the detail I want doing that. And I feel like this is the balance. We outline by machine. We shade by hand. And he's like, I guarantee you, 
and you know people can make all the japanese stereotype jokes you want but japanese people love technology like but they do they manage to like mix it with their old traditions right like if you go to japan like you'll see that like the old and the new merged perfectly and i think like if you went you know if you if you went to like 1860s japan well, actually, I guess technically O'Reilly invented the tattoo machine in 1891. But anyhow, let's say you you took a tattoo machine to 1800 Japan and said, hey, here's a tattoo machine. I guarantee you they would have used it. You know, right. I, I, right. Without a doubt, they would have used it. They would have made it their way. Um, I just had this question because um, – is that rooted in, in just uh, an enthusiasm for new technology in general, or is it like a practical decision? Both. both. I yeah. think they love new technology, but I think they also love speed and efficiency. But I think they also have a manner of making things their own. You know, if you think about like Honda building a company out of the out of his garage and taking a bunch of, you know, like rickety motorcycles to Europe and being called a dumb Jap and winning shit. And then, you know, building this huge company, but he essentially took a Western innovation and made something really good with it. You know, like I think there's a lot of that happening. Um, I think the Japanese will find ways to still keep, you know, and, and there's certain things that they'll I think like it's nice that they like they still do things by hand. There's still things that are like done handmade. But, you know, they've if, if any country has embraced technology, they have, too, as well, you know. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but so we talked about like the like the upcoming like you know because like Franco's got a wand coming out that's basically like you know um, it's similar to that other company that uh, fuck, that other pen one and I asked him like would you use it you know and I was, and and because I told him like I've heard they're really convenient they're really good on the other hand it kind of looks like a vape so I'm I'm torn and Tom was like I'm totally gonna try it. You know what I mean? And so for me, I feel like, okay, if he's willing to try it, maybe, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I will say this, there is something like, like I, we joked about this earlier, like you walk into a tattoo shop, to me, the two things that made me think of a tattoo shop were that buzzing noise and the smell of green soap. And I swear to God, sometimes you walk in here, it's silent, except for the music. And it's just like, <laughs> like, is it a tattoo shop or is it like a freaking whatever art studio? Like, what are we now? You know, like. I mean, we're open 11 to 7. Like, we sit here sipping our lattes and we have our consultations. You know what I mean? Like, we're not like, I mean, I just did the Friday. What have you become? I know, right? No, but it's true, though. Like, I just did the Friday the 13th one um, at Oliver's shop. Like, I, I did the one in June, right? And, and like, Deep Ellum is hilarious. Like, that place, like, uh, what's his face? Philip LaRock is always posting stories of just drunk people in the streets. I mean, you want to talk street shop, they bang them out. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we're very far removed from that. You know, we've insulated ourselves because I, you know, I've worked at biker shop. I've done that. I've done that. And for the Japanese style, I just feel that our style works. You know, and, and that's one thing too. I notice a lot in tattooing. Like you see a lot, of like this is real tattooing. This is not real tattooing. Tattooers should be like this, and it's kind of like, no, no, like no one owns it. You know what I mean? Tattoos are just ink and skin. Like you can decide what's right for you, what's right for your client, and that's it. You know what I mean? Like, like even your books closed joke is, is rad. Like, I think it's hilarious, but at the same time, I know a lot of tattooers that their books are closed, yeah. you know? And it's like, if that's how they choose to work, this is America, man, sure. you do whatever the fuck you want. So for me, it's like, also too, I can't have, I can't do a walk-in bodysuit. You know what I mean? Like, I can't, right. like, I need some time to prep that. Yeah. The work is going to dictate how yeah. you work. So, and I just feel like everyone just figure your, you know, what works for you. But I will say this, like going to the reason I did Oliver Peck's, you know, 13 thing aside from friendships and whatnot is because I felt like that was the closest I would ever. I did something like 70 something tattoos in 16 hours. And then actually my guy Tyler Harrington just did 160 something in 24 hours. Jesus. Yeah. No sleep, no drugs. He did it. But for me, it's like, you know. That was the closest I felt I was going to get to the stories I heard from Pinky Young, from Mike Malone, of when the ship came in and you're tattooing. It. Like, I remember Rollo telling me like they would tattoo. They wouldn't even count the money. They'd just throw it in, in, a, in a box and they would just keep tattooing. Same thing with Pinky. When that fleet came in, you work. He said his boss used to feed him bread like while he was tattooing. And it was actually kind of funny because of Oliver's thing. Like, they, you know, Oliver has tons of snacks there. My wife was there giving me candy. So, like, like while I'm tattooing, you know? It's so like, it was just like, like, you know, for the experience of it. And it was also cool because I don't tattoo like that. Like, I, like I am the consult appointment guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, I, I, you know, I mean, my books aren't closed, but 
I guess they kind of are. I don't know. <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess the books closed thing has kind of become like a shameful thing to some people. Sure, sure, sure. But, oh, no, but, I think it's hilarious. I think that's great. And I also think that like... I worry that when I... When my profile now says books closed on so many posts and yeah. in my bio that I'm, I feel like I'm getting less emails now and it's starting to scare me <laughs> as I might've shot myself in the foot. There. No, I think it's because of your work, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't yeah, going to say I, it. You know, I didn't want to be the one to tell you this, but it, it's not about your podcast. Yeah. No, no, well, but you know, yeah, I mean, it's a it's, problem. Yeah. but I think it's good too, because I've, what I've noticed is with, um, I think people are, are what I've noticed is even the people you make fun of are laughing. Because you do it in a good way. And, and also you're pointing out things that are true. And if you can't laugh at yourself, then, you know, what's the point, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Luckily, it's all about tattoos. So sure. I think most people have at least some self-awareness or some sense of humor, mm-hmm. hopefully. Yeah. But I guess, you know, they could be interesting to make fun of people who aren't self-aware. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well those people aren't going to take it well, you know. Yeah. I mean, even like my joke earlier, too, like you're talking about social media in here. We are doing a podcast, which I feel is like the hip thing to do right now. So, you know, like... You can criticize it, but you're kind of riding the same wave at the same time. And yeah, I mean, I get, I'll, I'll be honest, like, so I spend maybe an hour in the morning drinking my, co- like, I'll walk my dog. Well, I have two dogs. One of them likes to sleep in. <laughs> One of them likes to get up, and, you know, and this has to do with their ages. But, um, you know, walk the dog and then I'll go up there and I'll sit there, drink coffee and I'll do Instagram posts for myself, for my shop, for my convention. And, you know, like, and I never know. Like, I guess there's a part of me that feels like I have to do it because it's free, you know, and it's kind of like, like our convention, you know, you, and I, I feel like with the convention and with the shop, like, you know, our shop, we have eight people here. So it's like, you know, most, they're all booked, but at the same time, like as a shop owner, like I do feel a sense of responsibility to them as a convention organizer. I feel like if you come to our show and you don't work, I mean, granted, there's certain people that, you know, obviously some people book faster than others, but we want to get people for you. And so I feel like if this is a free service, Instagram, you know, or Facebook or whatnot, um, if I don't use it, 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 like maybe that's like, it's kind of like, um, just rude almost, you know, like it's kind of a missed opportunity. Yeah. Like, and, and it's kind of like, um, okay. So this is a funny thing here is like, I remember when I first started tattooing, which was in 98 and like I said, not that long ago, but even then old timers would tell me. And when I say old timer, I'm talking about guys like Chuck Eldridge, like that era. They would say, like, I wonder when this tattoo boom is going to end. And nobody had any idea, like, once, you know, how big it would blow up in the 2000 era. Like, once Miami Inc. came along. And even Japan, like, you know, like, I, I remember, like, what was it, the first Tokyo convention was, like, 99 or 2000. And then it, it felt like, like, in one year, like, tattooing was underground and then it was, like, all over the place. You know, and then now it's kind of, like, in the weird middle area. But I feel mm-hmm. like, you know, the same thing here. It's like, we have no idea where this is going, but... Like, I remember when I first started tattooing, working at a biker shop, and, you know, you put your money in your pocket, and you feel like, okay, I got to pay my rent first, and then I'm going to buy something, right? And now it's like you kind of have your appointments, so you know you already kind of know how much money you're going to get. Yeah. But I always feel like same thing with Instagram. Like, well, what if I stop posting and clients stop coming? Like, you know what I mean? Like, because I feel like right now that's your direct line to you know your client i mean even do you this still pop- have a sh- like a website shop website and we have a shop yeah we have a shop website we don't pay for ads that's that's always been a thing for us like we just i feel like our people should be our advertising like you know yeah like people should talk to people i mean well especially in a shop like this the work speaks for yeah itself. i feel like it, it like to me if, if i've done a good job on you you're gonna tell your friends you know, yep. but even this dumbass podcast, the only reason I'm doing it is because I want more clients. I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> you know? We'll see how that works out. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All right. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by Lucky Supply. Think about everything that you use when you're doing a tattoo. You can get each and every one of those items from LuckySupply.com. You know your clip cord's messed up, and you know you're trying to squeeze those last few drips out of that bottle of golden yellow. Well, do yourself a favor and stock up. Get it all from Lucky Supply at LuckySupply.com. This week, we're also sponsored by River Valley Printing Co., who offers the highest quality G-Clay prints, stickers, and pins for the tattoo community. You spend all that time painting, well, spread the word about your work, make some prints, sell them to your customers and also if you don't have stickers that your customers can put all over town and get you in trouble i don't know what you're waiting for check them out on instagram at river valley printing co 
or at rivervalleyprintingco.com. The best way you can support this show is by supporting our sponsors. And I do want to point out that these two companies have been so great in supporting this show and helping me get started in these first five episodes. If the willingness to support a project like this before it even existed doesn't show that they're willing to give back to tattooing, then I don't know what does. So thank you very much, Lucky Supply and River Valley Printing Co. To talk about a tattooing podcast, whether it's this one or one in general, do you think that these newer types of media are good for tattooing? Um, yeah, in the sense that like it all kind of like it, it meshes together. Okay. Um, like, for example, I, you know, like I'll, I've heard a lot of people complain about Miami Ink, LA Ink, Ink Master. I remember even getting an angry text um, when I went guest judge on Ink Master. Like, oh, my God, I can't believe you did that. I just haven't, you know, I thought you had integrity. You do books. Why did you do that? And I was like, it's a game show. I want, you know, I want to have a good time. Oliver and Chris are my friends. My sister lives in New York. It was hella fun, you know. But um, I can say this, um, you know, I've curated two museum exhibitions. I've spoken at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, Asian Art Museum. Um, and a lot of the, none of this would have happened had this explosion not happened. So you take the good with the bad, you know, um, like, so, and I think like, even like Ed Hardy talks about the importance of like when Lyle Tuttle did like the Janis Joplin tattoo, like sometimes it is important to be in that public eye. And yes, it does bring bad things. Of course it does, you know, but with that comes good things as well. Um, so I think one thing I'll say about podcasts is like, I cannot. I feel like I'm always late to technology. Like I missed Friendster. I was late to MySpace. I was late to Facebook. I was late to Instagram. I didn't do Vero because I could tell right immediately that that was a scam. And sure enough, it was. But, <laughs> which figure. I mean, like how did people even fall for that crap? Yeah. And it's just like, it was, I was actually really disappointed when I found out like that basically my hunch that it was a bunch of quote unquote influencers. Because it, it, right from the, the beginning, it was like, this is a scam. You can tell. You know, yeah. the wording, everything. But um, I'll say this, like, you know, like, there's a lot of shop talk. I tattoo three people a day. I have eight people that work here. So this is kind of our social hub. Tattooers and um, clients, everyone loves podcasts. I know so many people that, you know, I live in the Bay Area. So a lot of people commute to work here. Everyone listens to podcasts. Like I feel like radio's dead. Um, and even like, you know, like I'll be honest, like people complain like, oh, the Instagram algorithm changed and now I don't get likes and blah, blah, blah. But I'm getting more likes than I ever did. So I feel like it's more like, I just know, like, if it's a photo of me doing this, I'm going to get X amount. If it's a tattoo photo, I'm going to get X amount, regardless of what time or the algorithm. So I, mm -hmm. I don't think it really matters that much. But um, I do know that podcasts are kind of the thing right now. I know that everyone – I've never listened to a Joe Rogan podcast, but tons of people – that one and what – what is it, like This American Life? Those yeah, two have been recommended like to me by, like, a lot of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think, like, you know, once again, you're on the cutting edge there, bud. Um, but you know, but, but it's true. Like this is the new medium, you know, so whatever it is, it's going to keep going, you know? And, and like, I think tattooing, like I said earlier, none of us own it, but it's also like, it's, 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 it's like a, what is it? Like one of those snowballs gaining speed, turning into the huge snowball. And that's what's happening. You mm -hmm. know? Um, I think there's some like certain things that I think that are really good about this explosion is a, like we are seeing some of the best work around, you know? Um, we're seeing a lot of copycat bullshit, but we're also seeing some really original work. Mm -hmm. We are also seeing a lot of companies now owned by tattooers or tattooed people. That's nice, even though, you know, I think we're all, man I think everyone manufactures in China, but I don't think that's a tattooer issue. I think that's just America in general. You know, like our, you know, your, your laptop right there was made in China. This mic's probably made in China. This everything, you know? Yeah this shirt, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so, I mean, that's not, I, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily like contained to the tattoo community. You almost have to do it to make a profit. And, and yeah. And, and we'll see where that leads us though. Right. I mean, in the, in the long run, you know, I think that will be detrimental to this country. Uh, what did they say? Like Kublai Khan, he was the first one to actually make currency a national item. And now it's like banks. So banks don't see borders. So banks will literally shake hands before wars and say, we'll see you in five years and do that kind of thing. So they have their financial interests before their people's interests. But that's a whole nother topic for it's, you know, and yeah. I think that's kind of, you know, um, maybe, maybe that's too heavy for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah, we might lose some listeners. I know, right? Here yeah. to talk about tats. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs>
the thing I've noticed about doing the podcast so far that is interesting is that people really do respect a podcast just as a thing. Like when I first would mention to people, um, oh, I'm starting a podcast, which to me was, it's easier for me to produce this than the videos that I had been making. It's way faster, way more streamlined. Um, but for some reason, people just respect it so much more the way that they don't look at like a YouTube video. Because mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. kind of like a YouTube video is just like a goofy thing, whereas sure. a podcast, even though the podcast at the, t you know, it didn't even exist. They may have never even heard it, but they're like, whoa, you have a podcast? But it's right, like, yeah, right. I have two mics and two people and I sure, hit record. Sure. It's like not really a, anyone can do it. Um, and I think the whole DIY attitude is, is for, is it, the internet kind of creates it. It allows everyone to have their voice and to make things and put it out directly. And that's why we can have tattoo or run companies because marketing is just built into the internet. Anyone can have their own podcast. Anyone can have their own band or their own whatever. So are you gonna do? It? Are you gonna become a SoundCloud rapper? Is, I, that's kind of the vibe I'm getting that, here. Is, that's is, I'm trying to test yeah? the waters. Okay, sure, sure, sure. You're gonna. I, I might have a couple songs up, but I'm not gonna. I tell mean, if you want, we can tat your face because you're gonna need some more face tats. Yeah. But but no, I think you're right. I think that's definitely. Um, and that's also why I think like the net neutrality thing was a bit scary, is because like, or even like if you want to look at like social activism, and I'm not pro or against because obviously it'll depend on what the issue is. But for example, like people are using Twitter. You know, um, and that's something that I think like with the podcast, like you're right, like any two jackasses right here can do a podcast. But you're right. There is a certain amount of respect to that, um, maybe more. so. But I mean, like maybe more so than the YouTube channel, just because like, I mean, there's YouTube channels with like millions of viewers of people just eating pizza. You know what I mean? Like there's really yeah, everything I think that's why. you want out there, you know, but I think you're right. Like, for some reason, when it comes to podcasts, it's like, OK, let's just we're going to have two people and they're going to speak. So therefore, it better be interesting. They better be succinct. They better have thought about it. Maybe that's what it is. Um, but yeah. either way, like, you know, I think it's good. I think it, to put it out there. And I think it's just good to get more voices out there, you know? Yeah. I think people are gravitating more towards longer format stuff mm -hmm. in general. Uh, the way that people will binge a, an entire TV season mm -hmm. or something at a time. Yeah. Um, I think people are just looking for more stuff. Uh, and I even read somewhere that, that more musicians are putting out albums that they, they're not even that discriminatory against the tracks that they put. They just want more tracks because that mm -hmm. equals more plays, which right, is right. all that really matters. Well, for like I said, too, like in the Bay Area, there's people that live in, like, say, Stockton and drive an hour and a half, two hours each way. Yeah. And they'll throw on a podcast. And yeah. and a lot of them like, 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 for example, like, you know, if they like you or what you're doing or if they like someone's voice is soothing, maybe it's easy to drive to or they're learning something. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I, I like, what is it that the, the American life one, like, isn't that one like cool stories and yep. like actual cases and stuff like that. So people are actually feeling that you're actually getting some education out of it, possibly um, yeah. something more. But I do, I, I do believe it has replaced radio in a lot of ways. And it is a little bit more than just like, yeah, like something, you know, and I, I feel like with YouTube, um, while there are very many serious channels out there, I do think there's so many kind of fun and hokey ones that maybe it kind of like detracts from that a bit. The only press that YouTube gets is for the bad stuff. Sure, sure, People sure, do sure, fucked sure. up stuff yeah. and they put it out online and everything. So right, I, right, that, right. Mu that must be why it's hard to respect it sometimes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of time it is like 17 year old people that are just like, Sure. Talking to a camera. I mean, that's what my YouTube channel is, basically. So, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, showing everyone your room. What? <laughs> <laughs> your posters. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough on YouTube because I was I was making more and more videos and I, and I had bigger ideas and I was spending more time and spending a lot more money making them, which was fine. But then the views, even though my audience was growing, my views were getting lower and lower and lower. Hmm. And it was tough. And it's not like I was ever doing it for the money that I would make from the views on YouTube because I wasn't in a category where that would really sure. change my mind either way. Um, but it, I think that's what kind of pushed me to, to start doing this. Well, ironically, I actually never even went to your YouTube channel. Um, <laughs> who are you again? Uh, no, no. But I actually like I just saw the clips on Instagram and yeah. I thought they were hilarious. Like I, I think that one of like the black work one. And I think I sent that to like five friends. Like, mm -hmm. I thought it was fucking hilarious. And a lot of, like, that one of the <laughs> tattooing is boring. Like, dude, I was, like, laughing out loud. I was running around the shop showing everyone. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so you definitely, but I also, like, I think for me, there's only so far 
like the other day, my wife was like, you should make this, you know, account a business account because then people can call you and email you. I was like, fuck that. Like, no, I don't like, like I, don't, I don't I don't I don't even check DMs. No, like I don't want to deal with that, you know. Well, there, so let me ask you this then. Like, but do you feel like how much time do you invest in this? Because, for example, sometimes I feel like if I didn't do books, if I didn't do conventions, if I didn't do um, museum shows that I would be a better tattooer because of the time. But then there's times when I feel like if I didn't do those things, I wouldn't be a better tattooer because those things are also creative. Like I remember something grimy said in one of his, like maybe it might've been a book or an interview, but I want to say like 15, 20 years ago, but anything that provides that creative spark, whether it's a song or a movie or a painting is good. And it kind of like allowed me to be like, yeah, you know, like, like I could watch a movie even and be like inspired or I could, you know, something like that. And so I guess I, I would flip around and ask you this, like, do you think this podcast stuff is either a good for tattooing, you're sacrificing some tattooing or making you a better tattooer, or does it just kind of make you more of a cool guy? Cause you're not very cool. Um, but, or, or, you know what I mean? like, yeah, but, but what do you, th- what do you think? You know, I think that it definitely has had a positive impact on my tattooing and mm-hmm. just everything in general. Um, I mean, on top of just the sense of accomplishment of making a show like this and having people actually listen to it. And I've gotten so many cool messages from people saying how much they appreciate it and how it sparked something in them that they're missing. You know, people that don't get to come to a shop like this and talk to someone like you to get that, you know, to get that fix of inspiration and everything. It definitely takes a lot of time that I could be putting into tattooing Mm -hmm. directly. Sure, sure, sure. But I think I need to have more than one thing going on personally. I feel like and, I get and, bored. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, one of and the obviously things... you must be the same because of all the other projects yeah, yeah. that you take on. Oh, like, or for example, traveling, like, I think when you go out of your comfort zone, you go somewhere new, I think that's inspiring, you know, like, absolutely. Like, you know, I think that's important. I think that's, I mean, to be honest, that's a lot of why I wanted to be a tattooer is I felt like if I can get to a certain level, there's going to be a tattoo shop in every city in the world. So I can get, I can like use that as a vehicle to also travel. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and so, but no, but I mean, to be completely honest and not to sound like a, a dork or whatever, but I was super honored. Like, you know, when you asked me if I, I, I like I said, at first I was like, oh man, he's going to spook me or something, <laughs> which still could happen, I guess. But, you know, um, all right, but, guys, come on I in. Know, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all the, the, like all the Gatorade's going to come from yeah. the ceiling or something, but no, but you know what I mean? Like, or, or it'll be the, the pinkies from, <laughs> The green glide or the seat, you know, all that stuff's going to yeah, come we're gonna down. We're going to grease you down and yeah, start spinning you around you know, on the start, floor. Yeah, do the jelly wrestling. But um, no, but you know what I mean? Like I, it's it, for me, I felt like it was an honor. and Which it, is very cool to me that you would be honored by me asking you to be on the show. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, we can scratch each other's back. And, you know, no, <laughs> no, well, no, I mean but, that because to me, it's just like I just decided to do this thing and I've done a handful of episodes, but like it's kind of become a thing and to me that i'm very proud of that yeah well no and and like you said i think you're right though like right now um there's a mixture of your timing is very good podcasts are kind of like the new thing right now also too like you know and i'm not trying to gas you up here but your 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 skits like your funny skits like yeah they're funny but they showed an acute awareness of what is going on in tattooing and that's kind of who i want to talk to because i'll be honest like I'm, I don't want to hear about another exhibition with like something about ink, this, and oh my God, we're going to break new ground. No, you're not. You know, like there's certain things where like, and I don't want to sound jaded either, but you know, I feel like, you know, in the time that I've been around and the people I've been around, the work I've done, like I've seen a lot behind the curtain, you know, so I felt like this was something new and exciting and fun that I could actually get behind, you know? And I think like as you get older, um, you sort of want to pick and choose what you do. You know, not not yeah. just with tattoos, but just in general and anything like there's only so many hours in a day. So, you know, you pick what's important. So and like like I said, for me, aside from feeling honored, I did feel that this was something I wanted to do. Well, I'm glad you did. <laughs> 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 I do want to talk a little bit more about Tabori. Yeah, sure. How long have you been doing that? So it's been, uh, Tabori has been kind of a weird um, love hate thing for me. Um, I was shown how to do it basically 20 years ago I was shown how to make the needles and it's just one of those things where like I was kind of told a few basic things and then from there like literally told you now I just have to do it and then it's something that I've kind of toyed with for a long time and I just never fully committed to 
Um, and I think, um, so I have, uh, one of my good friends, he told me once. Well, sorry, before we go on for people that are just listening, explain what Tabori is just oh. to break it down. So Tabori literally means hand tattoo, um, or hand carve. Um, so for the Japanese, like I'm sure you've seen this where, you know, you use one hand as your stretch hand and it's also the fulcrum point where you poke in, um, a series of needles in the olden days, a lot of times it would be a wooden stick, you know, with needles lashed to it. Um, Japan had iron ore. So unlike the Polynesians, they had metal for a long time, you know, Japanese swords, needles, whatnot. So they were able to um, make, uh, uh, you know, it, tattoo implements like that, whereas, like, say, the Polynesians would use sharpened boar's tusks. So I was taught this method, um, you know, nearly 20 years ago, and it's just something that never really, I guess I just never fully committed to, you know, um, and maybe it, it seemed like too much of an uphill battle. Yeah, just laziness, maybe. Um, and that's why whenever making too many bucks, <laughs> yeah, right. I know about people that do Tabori, right. <laughs> no, but uh, you know, there's, um, there's a handful of people that I feel like really inspired me here. Like Horitomo being one of them, because, um, if you know Horitomo's history for a long time, he was known as Washo. And I remember before meeting him, like, you know, we'd hear like, dude, there's these two guys, Sabato and Washo from Japan and they're crazy and they do all this amazing work. And then, you know, a few years went by and all of a sudden I'm in Japan and I'm being told Washo is now Horitomo. He's in the family. You're under him, you know, bada bing, bada boom. And so he actually went from tattooing in a chair to tattooing on the floor, like old school style. He went from, you know, and started Tabori shading. So seeing somebody do that, it's kind of like, OK, well, then I really have no excuse there. I've also the sa- seen the same thing with uh, Sulapisi Liufau. He's a Samoan guy in uh, Orange County. Um you know, that place with that terrible hockey team, the Ducks. Anyhow, um, <laughs> but, you know, he did the same thing. Like when he was given his Sulape title and the right to use the Tatao tools, he had to basically start from, and he still, do, and, and both these people still do machine stuff. And even watching like Peter Sulape, Paul Sulape, these are people that are, I, 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 you know, Peter actually did my Tatao, but I really respect what they're doing because they've certainly chosen a tougher route. I mean, there is no doubt in my mind that, you know, machine is a lot easier. And even now too, like, you know, when we talk about like earlier, you're talking about like, you know, would I use like this type of machine or that type of machine? Like, you know, any of these machines is infinitely easier than to worry. But I will say this, um, you know, and I'm like, I'm grateful to my wife for a lot of things, mainly for putting up with my dumb ass. But, you know, it's also like finding your right life partner, the person who understands you and, so we kind of had this talk and she was like, you need to do my whole back to Bori. So, you know, the outline was by machine, but we're doing it all by to Bori. It's taking forever because I'm really slow at it. But, you know, that's the other thing too. Like, I think like, um, you know, I'm sure pretty much a lot of wives would agree that like, you know, being married to a tattooer is, you know, or, or husbands or vice versa or whoever's for that matter is probably a huge pain in the ass because we're egomaniacs and we're ridiculous, but my wife would agree with that. Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, but I think like it's like a huge sacrifice she's made. Cause I'll be honest, if we were doing this by machine, we'd be done by now. Like, in fact, she made a joke about there was another girl that started a dragon after her. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm already done with it, Yeah. you know, but it's by machine, but I, I do think it's important. And I think like that, that kind of sacrifice you make for your loved ones, you know, like to kind of support them. And um, I remember uh, I never met Mitsuaki Owada Horikin, but I consider him one of the past legends, past masters of Japanese tattooing. Um, I actually did get to see a set of his hand needles uh, that Pinky Yun had because they were friends. But, you know, he basically learned how to tattoo by doing a full body suit on his wife. You know, you can kind of see the progression mm-hmm. and whatnot. And so in a lot of ways, I think that's kind of reminiscent of that. Um but like I said, it, it's an uphill battle for me. Um, it's really hard. And, you know, there's definitely times when I, like, would rather grab that machine, you know, yeah. just throw that bishop on, do it quick. But I will say this. I, I think, and, you know, I don't know. You saw my wife's back, but I think that green's more solid, you know? It's, like, yeah, it's very right? richly Yeah, green. Like, like, there's a richness to Tabori. And I think, um, like, I've heard people say that, like, well, I just want to hand poke the white in, you know, like. And, 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 you know, so I think there's definitely, that's like really cool. Um, and then, like I said, the, there's a feeling of being part of something larger. And I know what the Is Samoan, that the main draw to you? Yeah. It's I just think like I, the, it's, the tradition of it. And I think being um, Japanese American, like I speak Japanese, I, but I grew up here, 
you know, I've made frequent trips to Japan, but I've always kind of had like one foot in each country kind of thing. So I think maybe, maybe that's part of me kind of like trying to reaffirm that sense of identity for myself. Um, and also just to keep up with these guys in here, you know, like I love this shop because like we all push each other, you know, like, and you know, I work, I work, I'm really lucky to work with such great tattooers, but I feel like that's one point where like, you know, it's like funny when Hori Fuji first moved here, he wasn't doing very much to and all of a sudden I'm looking over, he's doing a bunch. And I'm like, Oh my God, like, I feel like I'm slacking off here, you know, but mm -hmm. I, but I do feel there's a certain look. Like, I think once you get like a certain skill level, which I don't think I'm there yet, but once you get there, like, I feel like it's like a certain richness of vibrancy that you just can't get with the machine. Um, and I, I feel the same way about Tatao, you know, and I think one thing that I really respect the Simones for is that, you know, like when they do contemporary Polynesian, like they use machines, but it's pretty much a rule that if you're going to do the traditional Malofia, the traditional Malu, it has to be tapped. You know, and I love that. Like, I wish there was a thing in Japanese culture like that. Like, if this certain type of tattoo has to be done by Tabori. Um, on another note, what I'd like to say, like, is that it's also really nice to see that Tabori is alive and well. Like, I think looking around, like, like we're in a we're in an era where, you know, there's tons of Tabori artists in Japan, obviously, but there's tons of non-Japanese Tabori artists. You know, I see people in Australia, Europe, all over. And that's great, you know, like I think like, um, you know, I've never been one of those people that have felt that, you know, I feel like when I see non-Japanese people get Japanese tattoos, when I see non-Japanese people do Japanese tattoos, obviously you want them to do them well, you know, but I feel like it's it, it's cool. Like, I mean, like, you know, I'm proud of that culture and I like to see people appreciating it. You know, I think like obviously like you want people to study and learn and all that. But regardless, like, you know, there's a sense of cultural sharing and appreciation and i think those are those are really important so what do you think about the hand poking trend trend that's going on oh, right like now? The, like the stick and poke yeah kind of thing um i think it's cool like i mean whatever like like i said we don't own it um one thing i will say like i mean there's like okay for example there's like you know funny things like i remember like uh we were like it was like a tattoo paradise um sorry matt i, I feel like a dick right now like like maybe it was like an anniversary party or something, but for whatever reason, we we're all in DC. And I remember like Marco Hernandez stuck a needle in the end of a pencil on the eraser part. And he was like doing little hand poke tats on like this capital steps. I remember there was like a really douchey secret service agent on a bicycle that like jumped the steps and wanted us to be impressed. It was, it was like, it was like seriously like something out of Napoleon Dynamite. You're like, really dude? Um, okay. Oh, oh, I got another cool ass story. Like, cause, cause we've all done these party tats, right? Like, but it was never like an art form. Like it was like more just like us messing around. Yeah. Another cool story is like, so about this Friday the 13th thing, uh, Philip LaRocca did an eight hour shift in Texas, then got on a plane to go to LA to true tattoo to do another eight hour shift. And, and I'll probably get him in trouble with the FAA here and whatever. Then he'll, you know, his house is probably get raided right now, but, um, <laughs> he hand poked a little 13, like, um, by himself in the bathroom. <laughs> but as far as like, um, you know, like stylistically, like the quote unquote stick and poke artist, that's great. I think it's fine. What I don't like, okay, and I'm not saying that they're doing this, but I don't want to see that put in with like the Samoan thousands of years of traditions of Tatao or the Japanese 300 year tradition of Tabori. Mm -hmm. I feel like they're different animals. And even Tabori yeah. and Tatao, um, are different, although I will say this, like, um, like I remember doing the Florence convention in, I believe it was in 99, and they had all the Samoans and Japanese in one area because they were all on the floor. And, but I felt there was, like, some sort of, like, kinship there. Like, maybe Pacific roots, maybe people of color, maybe whatever, I don't know, considered foreign or whatever it was. But I also feel like there was, there was, because anytime I see somebody doing Tibori or Tatao, I feel like that person is going the extra mile. Like, they're not taking the easy route. And the reason they're doing it is cultural. Maybe they're doing it for more clients because, like, you know, I've seen some people that basically put costumes on for conventions where it's kind of like, you don't dress like that normally. You know what I mean? Don't be all ethnic today and then, you know, whatever. But I feel like if you're going to take the time to do that, then you're doing it for a reason. So all I'm saying is that, like, with uh, stick and poke, hey, have at it. Do it. That's great. You know, like, I'm not hating on that at all. But I do think it's different from Tabori or Tatao. Do you find that anything you've learned as you're pursuing Tabori more 
has uh, come back and changed how you look at stuff with machine tattooing? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, like I said, I, I do think there's a better color saturation. Um, I do find myself every time I start doing Tabori, like appreciating how much work the machine does. Like my finger hurts like pretty quickly into the session. Mm -hmm. um, I have to pay attention more. I have to, um, you need a much better stretch. Um, so like, that's like kind of like, well, you'll, I'll, I'll use a lower bench to get like a, a, a better leverage point. Um, but I think, uh, I have to like constantly tell myself, like kind of put that out of my head. Like, cause the first thought that goes through your head is like, God, I could do this faster. You know, I have to just think that this is what I'm doing, you know? And then, um, Hori Fuji gave me some advice of like, you know, kind of get your rhythm, like almost like let the kind of the rhythm do the work not not so much like poking it in kind of thing mm -hmm. and then um i mean you really sh should watch peter sulape work so 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 sulape peter is like like he's the tufunga that did my tatao but i mean this guy could do malafias in his sleep like i mean he's been doing them since he was 14 but regardless like like i think anytime you watch an expert craftsmanship or uh, sorry an, a, a, an excellent crafts person it's just amazing. Like, I don't care what they're doing, if they're carving, if they're tattooing, if they're painting, whatever they're doing, it's really great. And I think that's one thing I think of is that there's so much craft in that. I don't know that it's helping my machine tattooing. I, I think at this point I see them as such different animals, you know, like, I, and maybe I'm forcing myself to do that. Do you think there's any way to modify how a machine runs to be more like Tabori? Slowing it down or changing the... No. Nah. Just, uh, I mean, the amount of hits per second is so different. Yeah, like I, I don't think I don't think there, and I don't think there'd be a point. Right. Yeah, because the whole point is to not use the machine. Mm -hmm. You know, what I mean, and and that's what I mean. Like I don't like I think like the whole idea is to kind of like do it differently. So. Yeah. I've always looked at Japanese tattooing as a, a very scholarly thing, and something of like a refined taste almost. I don't, do you see it that way? Like it's kind of up on a higher pedestal of, I think, um, it, I, okay. I think that it's like anything where it really depends on your perspective. Um, I think one of the reasons why we put Japanese tattooing on a pedestal is just like the sheer, like volume of work, like, you know, a bodysuit compared to like a one point heart on your arm kind of thing. And, and mm -hmm. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but you're looking at two hours versus a hundred hours. Um, and also too, like, I think, and I think it's fair to say, and I've written this before that Ed Hardy single-handedly introduced Japanese tattooing to the West. Obviously other people had written about it, but he's the one that really brought it here. Like, you know, he wrote the books, he gave the seminars, like he really did it. Um, on another note, like, you know, I had the honor of, and rest in peace, Doc Forrest, but I did interview him. And, you know, when he actually went to Japan in 1973, the same year that Ed got tattooed by Horihide, he got his back done by Horihide as well. And he would tell me, you know, he's he was obsessed with Japanese tattooing. And, and he would, you know, a lot of his Swedish friends would be like, well, why aren't you doing Viking stuff? He was like, well, that's because what I grew up with. You know, it's like, it's what I know. Like, this is more interesting. And, I, and he wasn't saying it in like a weird, like perverted, fetish, exotic kind of way. He was just saying like, this is different from what I know. Um, I'm constantly told by... Like uh, people like, oh, Japanese tattooing is great because it has meaning. Everything has meaning. And um, and sometimes that's been lost in American tattooing. I think there was a time with Navy tattooing where, oh, you cross the equator, you get this. Oh, you did 5,000 miles, you get this. Oh, you you know, you get the pig, the, 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 the rooster, like the, everything had a meaning. Whereas now I think a lot of it's just art, you know. Um, but also too, you know, don't romanticize it, you know, because it's not like every Japanese client has studied and knows what God they have on their back and why, you know, some of them just want to look tough. Some of them have no mm -hmm. clue what they're getting. I remember Ed, um, uh, what was it in tattoo time or he wrote something about when he first went to Japan he was like, so stoked. He's like, I'm here. I'm tattooing these Japanese guys. Like it's going to be like, everyone here is going to be super educated. And they're pretty much like, you're American. Can you get us guns? You know what I mean? So <laughs> like, I think everyone has a romanticized notion. And for me, um, like on one hand, I get people that are like, oh, I can't deal with all these rules and this and that. And it's almost like tiresome, like Japanese tattooing. 
And then I'll get clients that are like, oh my God, that's so cool. So this means this. And if we add this and da, 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 you know, and I think like, it's almost like they're learning something along the way, almost like a, a scavenger hunt of information. Um, what I have noticed is when you can explain yourself and tell them why something is a certain way, people really enjoy that. And I think that's what they want, you know, and whether that's like a preconceived notion about what Japanese tattooing is supposed to be. Um, I can honestly tell you that, yeah, there is a lot of meaning. But I'll also tell you this, and, um, you know, I've done extensive research on Japanese tattooing, on Samoan tattooing as well. And you have certain things that mean things, right? But keep in mind, the people doing these were artists. So they're going to add their flair in there. You know, I remember Horitomo busted open. It's too long of a story to get into. But he had basically figured out that there's a certain story where they use a maple leaf and it should have been a spring flower. But, you know... And the tradition changed, and he's pretty sure it's because they didn't have the colors available. Like back then, there was just red, black, and red. Mm -hmm. So they basically changed it to fit that. And then, you know, if you do something, whether it's right or wrong, you do it for a few hundred years. It's a tradition. Right. You know what I mean? So sometimes wrong is right. So I think that's one thing that we all find really interesting. You know, and like, um, and, and that's for me, like, I think working with Horitomo is amazing. Um, I've had the the pleasure of actually, aside from like talking to him about a lot of stuff, I've also helped translate for certain like, you know, books and publications and whatnot. And, and just hearing him explain things and like he takes it further than anyone I've ever met. Like, you know, like the explanation of why these things happen and how he places things. And like, I, you know, I'm constantly in awe of that. And I think a lot of people that get into it too. Also for a lot of my clients, like I think they like to be able to like to know a bit more. Like, it's not just like, oh, this thing looks tough, but mm -hmm. it actually represents this, you know, a certain something. Um, sometimes I'll get people that will come in and they'll just be like, well, this is my theme. And then I'll give them an idea, you know, like, and, and we'll go yeah. from there. Or sometimes they have something more specific. And then there's times, too, where I've gone to a point where, um, like, I won't do something if I don't think it's going to be correct. Like, I'll be like, I'm sorry, but those two things conflict or that wouldn't have happened historically. So I can't do that. You know, and I think, um, you know, there is a certain part of it where it's like, you know, like I, I don't I don't think in tattooing the customer is always right is always correct. Like, I think the, you know, the worst tattoo is one the client doesn't like. But I think there's also, you know, your artistic freedom, your ideas. So if it's something that I just like for, goes against my principles of Japanese tattooing, I'll decline the tattoo. I mean, it's not like we're in an era where we're not the only shop in town. There's eight million tattooers out there. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. kind of like, if you want something, someone will do it. Right. You know, and I have my certain thing and my, and I've specialized and I've studied, I basically devoted my life to a certain type of tattooing. So I'm not going to do it incorrectly, at least to the best of my knowledge. Yeah. And I see it in, in uh, the street shop setting where people sometimes value uh, the meaning behind their tattoo more than even what it looks like at sure. all. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that Japanese imagery and, and all the, the history behind it and the stories and everything can give that to people who wouldn't find it on their own. Like you can almost talk them into that because then they feel like it gives them purpose or, or it like sure. validates their choice of getting it, Yeah, which I think is cool. And a, a lot of other stuff doesn't really have that the same way. Mm -hmm. Sure. Although one thing I will say is like, oh my God, the Wikipedia generation, like there's just like, I mean, there's a lot of really good information on the internet, but there's also a lot of erroneous information on the yeah. internet. <laughs> so, you know, um, although like, but we do appreciate people making effort, trying to learn things out there, but it's just sometimes like people come in with stuff. You're like, uh, I don't know if I agree with this, yeah. <laughs> you know, but at least you know that they're interested enough to yeah. try to do their own research yeah. and then you mm -hmm. can kind of guide them. Yeah. Cause I think a lot of people would come here hoping to be guided. Yeah, sure. Sure. I'm Definitely. sure some people Definitely. think they know their shit, but yeah. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I, yeah, I'd imagine a lot of clients are happy to be, schooled yeah. on that sort of stuff and, and and you know what it's happened like we had a client the other day he asked for something i was like i didn't know what it was and it was a really obscure reference and i asked one of the guys here he's like i don't know and then we looked it up in japanese like oh yeah okay there you go and he had you know so there we we were we were made aware of something we didn't know you know because yeah. i mean there, there's such a vast amount of history and culture and stuff like you know it'd be really hard to know everything unless you're horizontal he knows everything so <laughs> yeah. he's superhuman yes He's a cat, actually. He really is. <laughs> well, I do want to thank you for sitting down with me tonight. This was very cool, very interesting, and maybe we'll do it again sometime. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you for taking the time, and, um, you know, 
thanks for doing this and uh we appreciate it so if people want to check your work out on the internet um internet the website is stateofgracetattoo.com um the instagram is my instagram is state of grace talkie one word and the shop is state of grace tattoo and yeah Probably the ins- Instagram is probably the, the most updated because, you know, it's like a daily kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I don't know. The websites. So that's the other thing, too. Like, I feel like the website, it's just such a pain. You got to send stuff to your web guy and da, da, da. So I feel like, you know, I, I, I think that's why Instagram has become such a thing for tattooers. Like, well, let's say you're a Japanese tattooer. Like, if you're a guy that's doing palm-sized stuff, you can post some, you know, put something new every day. But for me, I'm going to finish the back piece. It's not, you know, it's few and far between. Yeah. So for me, Instagram's nice because I can post something in progress and I don't feel quite like it has to be like this finished shot, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, that, you know, I can post what I'm eating, which is really important. I mean, that's super <laughs> important. <laughs> you know, so. I think it's it's cool to follow people who do big work because you kind of get, you, you start recognizing, mm-hmm. you know, if you're doing a few backs. Sure, sure, know, sure. To see it and to kind of be part of the journey. Yeah. As, it's funny too because you get like like I had one where some people are like oh my god that was fast like they're actually following the progression yeah. and that's kind of cool too. So yeah, it's cool to know that people are paying yeah. attention enough that they're mm-hmm. following it mm-hmm. and recognizing yeah. it like that. Definitely. All right, let's get the fuck out of here. Let's do this. All right. all right, thank you all for listening. We will see you next week. Another huge thank you to this week's sponsors, Lucky Supply and River Valley Printing Co. I hope you all check Talkie's workout on Instagram at State of Grace Talkie. That's all one word. You can also follow the whole shop at State of Grace Tattoo. And let's not forget the Bay Area Tattoo Convention, which you can follow at Bay Area Tattoo Convention on Instagram. You can follow me on Instagram at Andrew Stortz. And remember, if you like this show, consider giving it a rating or a review on iTunes or wherever else you're listening to it. I really enjoy hearing from all of you on what you think about the show, so please keep the messages coming. I do my best to get back to everyone, so I look forward to hearing from you next. Don't forget to tune in next week where we will be joined by Steve Byrne, the tallest man in tattooing. Until then, 